Well, I'm very pleased to say that Lisa Denny from the Overseas Development Institute here in London joins me in the studio. She's a specialist in security and development in Sierra Leone. Lisa, thanks very much for coming in. Would you echo what the president of Sierra Leone has said there, that international assistance is absolutely crucial in trying to combat what's happening over there? I think that's right. I mean, there, are, there is sort of excitement that this, this uh, new drug might be trialled, um, but I think we need to be aware that that is a trial. People aren't necessarily sure how that's going to work, and there's certainly going to be a long time before those supplies become available. So in the more immediate term, we need to be looking at prevention efforts, and certainly the international community is now ramping up their response to this. You've had the World Health Organization and the World Bank both committing more resources, uh, and what that needs to do is, is bring in more medical practitioners. Uh, we have to remember that these are parts the world where there are very limited numbers of trained doctors and nurses. So in the district where I work, for instance, uh, in the north of Sierra Leone, there's one, uh, one doctor for the entire district hospital. Uh, so that's going to be very important. It's also important to bring in more medical supplies. Some of the things that we've been hearing from the Ebola treatment centres is that, is that there are a lack of, of basic supplies like surgical gloves, um, rehydration salts, even body bags to dispose of, of bodies in a sanitary manner. So those sorts of uh, supplies and support are going to be needed in the world health organization has sort of said that this will will be needed over the next six months. Now Sierra Leone is sort of sandwiched in between Guinea and um, Liberia. Mm. Both countries have closed their borders. How is that impacting on how the people within Sierra Leone feel? Um, this is post-conflict, you know, a country that was supposed to be moving forward and was showing some hallmarks of progress. Mm. And now this is a massive step back. That's right. I think it is important to recognise, you know, Sierra Leone's been out of conflict for about 12 years now and some really important gains were being made. You've had three peaceful democratic elections. Um, you've had some important uh, policies brought in, particularly in the area of health. You've had a free health care initiative, which has provided free health care access to maternal and lactating mothers and children under five years old. And you were really starting to see people starting to use those systems. The danger with, with, with something like Ebola is that that progress is really set back. Uh, and I think, as you say, with the borders being closed, that creates uh, a higher level of fear. It's going to be difficult to enforce um, a lot of those, those border closures um, because of the porous nature of the borders Seriously? in those areas. And you certainly have people who actually cross over from Guinea into Sierra Leone, for instance, to use the free healthcare system that exists in the country. So that's going to be a real logistical challenge. Now, you were there in June. What was the kind of the most striking thing that you noticed in trying to kind of deal or get the message across to people both within uh, rural areas as well as in the capital? At the, at the time that I was there, the outbreak hadn't uh, really reached Sierra Leone. There were sort of some reported cases, um, but it hadn't been confirmed. So at that point, a lot of the public health messages were about things that you shouldn't eat. So people were talking about not eating bushmeat, uh, not eating mangoes that have fallen from trees where the bats that carry the virus um, might have eaten them. Um, but people weren't yet really aware of, of just how severe the, the crisis was going to be. And I mean, the thing that really strikes you is, is just the very limited capacity of the health systems in these countries. We have to remember that Guinea, Liberia, Sierra Leone are really three of the most fragile um, countries in the world. They're at the bottom of the United Nations Human Development Index. And as a result, they have very weak health systems. Uh, and I think that's an important thing to bear in mind. They're also dealing with a myriad of other illnesses and diseases uh, that kill people on a much more regular basis, like malaria. Those challenges haven't gone away. So now what you have are these fragile health systems dealing with all the things that they were dealing with before, and on top of that, trying to cope with the world's largest outbreak of Ebola to date. We do need to kind of put it into context. I mean, 1,200 people have died. There have been more than 2,100 cases reported across, this, I think, the four countries, which also includes Nigeria. As you mentioned, uh, malaria kills more people, I think, in hundreds of thousands, as, as does TB. So do you think for people living... Um, on the ground, for them, they're not really aware of the kind of circus that is happening um, from the reporting that we're doing in the West. I mean, I think you're right. It does need to be kept in context. And as you say, there are actually a lot of other diseases that kill people at much higher rates more regularly. Uh, and it's a shame that, that there isn't more attention uh, paid to those diseases on a more regular basis. At the same time, Ebola, because of the, the nature of, of the way that people die from the disease, is, is particularly frightening. And I think that, that is the level of fear that, um, that is now existing in Sierra Leone. So while a number of the symptoms that, that people present with in Ebola are similar to, mm -hmm. to symptoms that you get with other diseases, vomiting, diarrhea, fever, and so on, 
in these cases, people are presenting with those symptoms and then going into Ebola treatment centers, and because of the high levels of, of fatality associated with the disease, not coming out. Uh, and that creates a lot of fear, as well as the fact that people are then kept in isolation wards. Their family members can't have contact with them. And I think that that, that sort of um, environment leads to the creation of, of, of lots of rumors and whatnot that we've heard with people suggesting that actually the Ebola treatment centers are being used to harvest organs or, or infect people with the disease. And, and there's a lot of suspicion, isn't it? So how do you break down those barriers? I think partly it's about uh, public health messages. Um, I think that, you, you know, and this is something that, that the governments in these countries have been trying to, to, to strengthen, but I think some of the international support needs to focus on making sure that those people who have influence in the communities um, where people are living, like traditional healers, local chiefs and so on, that they're brought on board so that they're also um, involved in, in, in providing people with accurate information uh, so that people will actually report cases. It was a very worrying statement that was made by... Uh, uh, Joanne Liu from the WHO about mm. saying that, you know, it might take up to six months, it could be even longer. We don't know because we just don't know how many people are infected uh, and they don't know and they may well then pass on the virus without mm. realising and those numbers just keep continuing. What do you think needs to be done to in order, in, in order to contain it? Well, again, I think it's, it's, the focus has to be on prevention. Um, there have been some estimates that actually the number of reported cases that we're dealing with at the moment are only 25 to 50% of, of actual cases. So that shows how many cases people think are probably um, existing and just, just aren't being reported. So it has to be about encouraging people to feel... Um, to feel safe in coming to, to treatment centres and understanding that that will actually help them um, in the long term you know, to survive the disease. At the moment, part of the reason you've got such a high death rate is because there haven't been sufficient resources to help tackle the, the outbreak. I think with this new, uh, new tranche of international support that's coming through, those efforts can be, uh, can be strengthened and hopefully you'll then see more survivors. And hearing those survivor stories I think is important so that people know that this isn't necessarily a death sentence mm -hmm. if you if you uh, report it early enough. Okay, Lisa, thank you very much for your time. Thank you.